Hello, hello and welcome to our weekly credit chat that we host every single Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern here on YouTube and on Twitter. Credit chat is a time when we get together to talk about credit and money issues that matter to all of us. And it's part of our initiative here at Experian to turn these insights into action. Every week we cover a different personal finance topic and today we're talking about how to make smarter money decisions. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce our guest today. Our guest is Carl Richards. Uh, Carl Richards is a certified financial planner and the director of investor education for the BAM Alliance, which is a community of over 130 independent wealth management firms throughout the United States. He's the author of The Behavior Gap, Simple Ways to Stop Doing Dumb Things with Money, and just published yesterday his latest book, The One-Page Financial Plan, A Simple Way to Be Smart About Your Money. And this will be a book that we'll be talking with Carl about uh, later today. Uh, you also know Carl from his weekly sketch column in the New York Times. Let me show you that. And he's also writes a column in the Money. In the, I'm sorry, in the Morning Star Advisor. Through his simple sketches, Carl makes complex complex financial concepts easy to understand. Carl's art has appeared in studio. I'm sorry, in a solo show at the Kimball Art Center in Park City, Utah. Other showings include the Parsons Gallery in New York, the Schultz Museum, the Mansion House in London and on display in businesses and educational institutions across the country. Carl has been featured on Marketplace Money, The Leonard Laporte Show, Oprah, Forbes.com, and dozens of other publications. In addition, Carl has become a frequent keynote speaker at financial planning conferences and visual learning events around the world. In fact, he'll be the keynote speaker at FinCon this year. Super excited, Carl, to have you with us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for doing it. I love these. I'm just going to show some of your awesome sketches here, and I'll, I'll go back to some of these a little bit later. Um, also, want to let everyone know that we have Rod Griffin here. He is our director of public education. And uh, really quickly, my name is Mike Delgado, and I'm the community manager here at Experian North America. I want to let you know that if you'd like to join Carl, uh, we're actually on Twitter right now, and you can use the Credit Chat hashtag. And uh, if you do go to Twitter and do the search for the Credit Chat hashtag, you can see the discussion happening right now. And simply by tweeting out using the credit chat hashtag, you'll be able to we'll be able to see your tweets and your comments and questions. So please join us there on Twitter. And if you would like to interact with us here in a Google Plus Hangout, you can do it a couple different ways. Um, on the bottom left hand side of your screen, there's a little widget that says "Be part of the conversation." If you click on that link, you'll be brought into a special YouTube chat room where you can thumbs up content. So as Carl's talking and something that you really like, go ahead and thumbs that up so we know that that topic is interesting to you and that's very helpful for us. Also, if you have any questions or comments for Carl, you can go ahead in that app and be able to post your questions there for Carl. So just want to let you know a couple different ways that you can participate with us. And last, this is April 1, and so this is a special sponsored uh, hangout by Credit Swagger Power Drinks. It's a, a drink that will help I you love, lower... I love those. I'm so <laughs> happy to see those guys as the sponsor today. Yeah, it'll lower your blood pressure and your credit utilization rate. So Every day for lunch. <laughs> exactly. So anyways, uh, Carl, thank you so much for joining our Hangouts today. How are you doing? Fantastic. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited. I you got so much going on. It's such a cool idea. Thank you for doing it. And I enjoyed the last one we did, so it's fun to be back. Cool. Thank you. So, Carl, first of all, I want to ask you, with your busy schedule, your writing, your speaking, how do you have fi find time to write a new book? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's been so busy that I, I'm wondering myself. You know what's interesting to me? I'm a big fan of byproducts. So, to me, it's like, look, I have these amazing conversations with people all the time about money. It's kind of my job. And so then I think, like, that's the core. And then I think, well, wait, if I just recorded what we talked about, that could be a good column or a blog post. And then I wake up one day and you've got 50,000 words of columns <laughs> and blog posts and you think, well, how about we weave those together with some narrative and make them into a book? So to me, it's not you know, distinct compartments. It's all one big thing. I see. Carl, so do you set aside time in your day to like focus on the book as you're doing this? Uh... You should ask the people that work with me that question. <laughs> you'll, probably get a you'll probably get a different answer. Um, so no, most of the time it's just trying to come up with really good ideas. And I, I actually do a lot of my writing by talking. Um, okay. It's a little secret. Like I dictate a whole bunch of stuff. Because I don't get, this is something Seth Godin taught me, right? Very few people get talker's block. 
You know what I mean? So right, whenever I right. hit a blank screen, I just talk through it and pretend like, oh, if I was telling this to a friend, how would I do it? And that's that's how I get through it. That's awesome. Well, you got to definitely do a podcast at some point. I, I'm. We're. It's in the works. Thank you. Awesome. That's yeah. I've never thought of as a book as a byproduct before. <laughs> I think that's a first. Well, yeah. I mean, what it, it, that was the brilliant, first. Brilliant, but it's first. Yeah, it was the first book when I looked down and realized, like, look, there's fifty thousand words. You know, like a pile of fifty thousand words there. I didn't want to just slap them together as a, you know, like there's a lot of those books that are just blog posts slapped together. Yeah. We didn't want to do that, but it served as a good starting point to sort of, what, what are the common narratives? What stories could we weave through this whole thing and turn it into an actual book? Carl, I'm curious about how you chose questions because you've been taking questions for such a long time and answering so many people's questions. How did you go about choosing the types of questions that you would answer in this new book? Um, they were the ones that kept coming up. You know what I mean? Like it was. I've said this bef about this book more than the last one. I I kind of didn't want to write it. It was sort of. You hear this every once in a while from authors where they're like, I just had to. You know what I mean? Like it was. It was keeping me up at night. It was bugging me. I just wanted to get it done. And the reason it was keeping me up at night is because I kept getting asked the same questions. So I tried to reduce them down to like, okay, what are the real important questions that everybody seems to have about financial planning, if you will, like planning for their financial future. How can I put those in one book? And then the hard work we did was like trying to figure out how they how we could give people templates to use no matter what stage they were in life. So it, mm -hmm. it feels at least we put a lot of work into the idea of making it useful no matter where you were. Carl, how did you, um, after you kind of went through and and, and found like some of the most popular questions you're getting over and over again. How did you decide to organize this book to make it just really reader, you know, user friendly as as a reader to go through this? That's a really good question. Um, one of my um, favorite things is to use narrative, like story, as the. I, I've just found people respond so much better to a. a like trying to get a principle across, a concept across, if they can see it in a story. And my goal always has been to get people to do what you're just doing. Like I really want people to like, oh yeah, no, I've done that. Yeah, I've done that. Like and suddenly they're in the story. So that was the goal was like organizing it based on the concept and then saying, okay, how do we illustrate that concept with a story? What stories do we have from the past? How do we get those into the book? Carl, have you seen over the years certain trends or types of questions that have have questions changed over the years for you that you've seen? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Like there's certainly, I mean, there's the ones that are always there. Like you know, how do I deal with debt or when should I save for education seems to be around. But then they they get these spikes, right? Clearly, the investment world, what's going on in the markets, will drive some of the questions like should I be investing in hedge funds right should I be buying real estate now like that that one you know 2006 7 and now we're starting to see it again right like I, it would be really interesting actually as I'm using my hand so much to to see the Google <laughs> charts right like, yeah 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 investing in real estate I bet you would see a huge spike in 2005 6 maybe into 7 drop and I bet it's starting to spike again so the market sort of drives some questions you get asked you know, and, and that brings to mind like a lot of things you've been talking about and preaching about, which is that the emotional nature of how we spend money and some of the problems that go along with being very emotional with our spending. Carl, can you talk a little bit about um, the some of the irrational decisions that we make when it comes to money? Yeah, where do you want me to start? <laughs> you no, know, I and and by the way, we all we all do it. You know, that's the yeah. really yes. important thing for us to understand is that it's a human problem, right? So we shouldn't, that's I think where we need to start is we shouldn't feel bad about it. You know, that's kind of where we need to start and recognize that yeah. we do it and don't, don't be overconfident. But here's like the classic one. The classic one is buying high and selling low, right? And that sounds so stupid. Like, well, who would do that? Well, we all do and here's why we do it. We are sort of, at least I believe, we're genetically hardwired to get more of the stuff that gives us security and pleasure and get away from things that cause us pain as quick as possible. Mm. Right? And in fact, they've done some studies. There's a great study in Jason Zweig's book um, 
what's it called? Your your money in your mind or your money in your brain? Uh, your money in your brain. And there's a study in there where they hooked people up to brain scanners. I don't yeah. know what they're called. And they had them talk about like a masochistic study. They had them open their brokerage statements while hooked up to brain scanners. <laughs> Whoa. And, and if, if you were down, if the statement was down, like in other words, if you sort of saw red on the statement, you process that in the same part of your brain as you did sort of mortal danger, kind of where I'm from, a, a grizzly bear breaking through the front door. Really? And if, if your statements were up, in other words, sort of green, right, you process that in the part of your brain where you processed um, security or pleasure. And, and right out of the book, if I'm remembering correctly, right out of the book, that's, uh, and this is out of the book, don't blame me. <laughs> for men, that was the same part of the brain as sex, and for women, that was the same part of the brain as chocolate. So I don't know what that means. That's a whole other subject, obviously. <laughs> but, but think about that. Like if, if you're watching your investments go up, and in your brain, you're processing that in the same part of your brain as you do pleasure, mm. It's really hard to not say I want more of that. And then when it's scary, 2008 and 9, right? And you're processing that brain as like like there's a grizzly bear coming through the door. I don't really care what you tell me. Like I don't really care about your facts and figures. I don't care about your like try telling a 16-year-old, you know, something rational when they want to do something irrational. It just throws fuel on the fire, really. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get my hand off that stove as quick as I can. So that, I think, is the big mistake that we make all the time. Everybody else feels good, we feel good, we invest. Everybody else feels scared, we get scared, we get out. Carl, I'm wondering, I'm wondering personally, like, because this is something that we all deal with, um, emotions run, and especially if you're, especially when you think about the stock market and investing and your, your stock that you're putting a lot of money into starting to go down and your gut reaction is to sell, um, that fear comes in. How do you temper that? How do you, like, you personally, when you're kind of tempted to mm -hmm. run with emotions, how do you balance, like, what you know about investing and what you're counseling others to do with your own feelings that you're dealing with? Yeah, I, I think I just try, I mean, look, this is, I'm not saying I'm good at it. I'm really good at getting other people not to act emotionally. I'm not particularly great at getting myself not to act emotionally because it's hard. You know, that's why a really good advisor is so valuable. But here's what I think the, the, the only key I found is, so number one, connect your investment decisions with a set of deep values, right? So if, if you know why you're doing it, at least, at least I hope that makes it a little bit easier. Right? So, so I've yeah. got a set of values. I want to be secure and independent or whatever those values are. I, on top of that, I built some goals, which that's chapter one and chapter two of the book. And so I, I have some goals now. And then after that, and only after that, right, like I've thoroughly diagnosed, then I went out and found investment product. Like as the least important, still mm -hmm. important, the least important part of the step, those products are inextricably linked to my goals. So... If the market change, if the market gets scary, I, I I go through this process. I say, okay, all right, that's right. Let me review my goals. Are my goals still the same? Yeah, my goals are still the same. When I built this portfolio to meet to give me the highest likelihood of meeting my goals, did I use historical evidence and was it built sound and rational portfolio based on my goal? Yes, it was. Have my goals changed? No, my goals haven't changed. Okay, maybe I can say no to that emotion because I've got a deeper yes here. You know, my set of goals. So that's number one. Number two is remember, right? Like that's, I think, maybe the three most important words in financial planning. Remember, remember, remember. What happened last time you got scared? See, that's the benefit we all have. I mean, anybody that's been around the last 10 years at least, we've got a perfect laboratory mm. to look back and go, ah, oh, wow, yeah, that didn't work very well, did it? Like when I sold in 2009, March of 2009, that didn't work. And now I'm feeling comfortable again, and the market's up 200%, so remember, remember, remember what it felt like last time. Carl, I really like how you mentioned in the very beginning you are talking about really thinking about your, your big goals, your, your, your deep values, and then, and then after that, looking at financial products that might go along with that. Can you talk a little bit about how does someone begin to think about those deep values, because... What you're saying is, if you have, 
if you could attach your, I guess your finances to deep values that you have, you're maybe you're going to be more likely to stick to it because it's like maybe a, a deep value of mine might be I want to help my kids through college. And so because that's a deep value of mine, education and my kids going to college, that can help me begin to think about what are those financial products to help me with that process. I was, I'm curious about like what is that, how does someone begin to find what those deep values are to yeah. then assign? First, let's just really emphasize why that's important for a second. So okay. imagine just for a second, walking down the street in your hometown, and you run across a guy who hands you a bottle of pills. No, actually he doesn't, sorry. He hands you a piece of paper with something written on it and says, go to the pharmacy and fill this and take it. And you think to yourself, well, he's got a white coat on, you know, like, you should go do that. And then you take that and you go into this scary place called a pharmacy with a lot of people with white coats on and you hand them that piece of paper and they give back to you this jar of stuff and it, you have to sign all sorts of things that say you won't sue anybody because this will likely kill you and then you go home and you take it. Right? Like, of course you wouldn't do that. Like, accepting a prescription from somebody who's mm. never even met you and certainly hasn't had a chance to diagnose and yet we go on and watch the Financial Pornography Network all the time mm. and somebody who we don't know, oh, but they had a tie on. <laughs> like, no, sorry, I didn't mean you've got a tie. It was no <laughs> I was going to say, now, just because I'm wearing a tie, yeah, no. have a good reason to be. I know, I know. But, but they had a suit. They looked responsible. So, so all I'm saying is, geez, when, what other part of your life would you take a prescription without diagnosing? So... I think that's. I think that actually leads to like almost all of our problems. Is we're just running around, hmm. picking prescriptions up, without ever stopping. So how do you diagnose? Like the way you diagnose is look, have a conversation, and that's sort of that was one of the goals of the early part of the book was to give people the conversations to have to help them diagnose. And the one conversation I think that helps a lot about the values thing is is just a simple one. And I was originally taught this a guy named Bill Backrack wrote a book about it, a version of this question. So I've tweaked it a little bit. And it's just and it sounds silly, but sit down either by yourself or with a spouse, a friend, a partner, an advisor, and just ask yourself this question, why is money important to you? Now there's a tendency to want to bail out of that question as soon as possible because it's uncomfortable. It's really So people normally say freedom or security. Those are the two kind of cop out. I mean, they're, they're valuable, they're, but they're just like, get me out of this question. But keep moving, right? Keep moving up sort of this or deeper. Ask why again. Like, why is security important to you? And I had this conversation with a lady. She was an emergency room doctor. And if you know anything about emergency medicine, it's uh, you got to be on your game, right? Like just to become a – to get into medical school and then to get one that uh, – that residency, super competitive. So this was type A personality. She came in. I said, hey, why, you know, we sat down, exchanged some pleasantries, said, why is money important to you? And she said, you know, freedom. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Tell me more about freedom. Like, what, what, what's important about why is money, why is freedom important to you? And she said, mm -hmm. flexibility. And my goal always was somebody was going to cry in this meeting and it wasn't going to be me, right? Sort of a joke, but I, I just thought like, we got to get to the emotional level, and and she said uh, flexibility, and I said okay, that's great. What's what's important about flexibility? And now there was a pause, and a little bit of emotion. And it was time. Carl, I just want some time. Mm. It will tell me a little bit more about time. Like if you had all the time you needed, which we'll define in a minute. That's called a goal. Mm. If but right now the value of time, what would be valuable about that? Why would you want more time? And now there's a long pause. And she said, Carl, I just want to have a family. Mm. And I haven't even had the time to think about it. Mm. Right now, those are her values. They're not mine. They're not yours. But her, yeah. to her, there was nothing more important about money than that. Now imagine how much different the, 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 the investment process and strategies we're going to use and ultimately the product we're going to pick is going to be how much different it would be if she had said, I want to grow the business. I want to build eight clinics. I want to sell them and move to Maui. Right? totally different set of lenses to view the rest of our decision through. So that's why it's so valuable to spend the time to do that. Well, Carl, I love that. And I, I mean, you're really like, 
almost like a behavioral psychologist really getting down to the nitty gritty of <laughs> right of what people really feel about money. Well, I, I, I mean, I think part of the reason we've been so dysfunctional, you know, a, a around money and investing, and oh, believe me, I'm, look, I'm the worst, there, like, I'm, I need this just as badly as anybody else does, so please, all of us are in the same boat. The reason we collectively have been so dysfunctional is I, I think we're skipping that part, right, the part where we say why. Like, we're doing a lot of this stuff just because our neighbors did it, or we saw it on the financial pornography network, or we heard it on the radio, and... And we're never stopping to say, hey, you know, like even spending, does does buying all this unnecessary plastic crap actually make me happy? Like we're never stopping to ask those questions. That reminds me, I'm looking up a chart that you made here. Let me see here. Am I supposed to be trying to reply to tweets at the same time? No, 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 Carl. <laughs> oh, <all right. laughs> <I expect you> to... <laughs> Let's see here. I found this chart that you made here about... Yeah, that's that's funny. That's just the one I was just talking about. I'll tell you. I'll try and be super fast. Yeah. The iPhone 5s, right? Wasn't that it? Wasn't that when Siri came out? Was the 5s? I think I don't. I'm not sure, but I think yeah. that's what S. I think that's what S stood for. If I remember, it was Siri. Is that right? I think so. Yeah. Let's pretend like it is. If it's not, <laughs> forgive Good me. Enough. I'll, 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 I'll <laughs> sort of facts get in the way of a good yeah, story. All yeah. Apple fanatics, forgive me for a minute. But I, <laughs> you know, let's say it was the 5S, and I remember I had the 4, and when the 5S came out, I said to myself, well, that's, that's kind of nice, right? That's neat. Why, I don't understand why I would need that. And then I was shocked. Like three weeks later, it, the 5S arrived on my door. And I don't know how it got there, right? Like, and, and I remember thinking, how did I go from, like, that's nice to in my house in a matter of weeks, right? And, and I just told myself that story, like, that's nice. Oh, that's pretty cool. Geez, I really need that. And then I told myself the classic one, of course, like, that'll make me more effective and far more productive. And the next thing I did, I ordered it. And it's just shocking how quickly we can go from thinking that's nice to owning the next thing that we may not even need without asking ourselves a question first. Right? It's absolutely true, yeah. We can we can convince ourselves that we need something in a heartbeat. Yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. So all I'm saying is let's just put a stop in there and say, yeah. hey, why? Why? And and it's okay if we still want it. That's okay. Let's just do it on purpose instead of by default. That's right. Hey, Carl, can you hear me okay? I can hear you now. Okay, yeah. sorry. I got I got booted out for the last, like, minutes. I totally <laughs> sorry. so sorry, Carl. I missed your... No, 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 no problem. We just told, like, the most... Right, right, Rod? The most amazing story. It was an incredible story. <laughs> it was incredible. Absolutely huh? right on point. <laughs> golden. Absolutely golden. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, well, thank you, Carl, for, for sticking with us, and I apologize for that technical no mishap. Um, so, Carl, um, question number five that we're going to be tweeting out here is, what are some steps that we can make to start making smarter decisions about our money? And one of the things that you've just mentioned is, is first of all, looking at your and being really serious about what is it about money that really matters to you and really digging deep. And I, that's something that you, I'm sure your book is, is getting into. Uh, once you've kind of really thought about why money is important and what you want to do with it and kind of tying it to, you know, things that are important to you, values. What are then some next steps people should take after that initial kind of diagnosis, self-diagnosis of looking at, or maybe even talking with someone like you, Carl, about yeah. what really matters? What are some next steps after that? Yeah, so right after, I mean, to me, you sort of get clear about values, and that discussion naturally will lead, like the example we used earlier where time to have a family was important, it would naturally flow into some goals, right? So then you start getting sort of more concrete around your goals. And I really like using the word, in fact, Chapter 2 is called guessing about your goals. Hmm. You know, and I love I, that, that word guess I'm using really purposefully. Um, because I, I think what happens as soon as we think of goals, especially financial goals, that often are um, totally uncertain and they're often way out in the future, 
you know, I can tell you what often happens with financial planning. Like, you'll say, like, hey, we need to know what your utility bills are going to be 27 years from now. Right? Like, and then after you're done with that, would you please tell us the date we should end this analysis? <laughs> In other words, like, what date are you going to die? And so they're all stuff we don't know. So I think sometimes what happens is naturally we're like, ah, forget it. I don't even know. Like, forget it. I'm just saying, look, instead of doing that, let's call them what they are. Let's let the little secret out. They're guesses anyway. Like, it doesn't matter how much research we do or analysis we do, they're guesses anyway. I mean, we might call them assumptions or we might call them forecasts, but they're guesses. So this idea of guesswork to me is really valuable. So instead of just throwing it out and saying, forget it, let's give yourself permission to relax a little bit, let go of that false sense of precision, and make a guess. Hey, I think I'd really like to be able to afford to send my kids to, you know, the in-state schools. And I think, I, you know, like I'm, when I'm about 55, it would be nice to slow down at work and go teach at the college. You know, still work, but make a little shift, right? I think that, right? But I'm only 45. I'm only 40, so I don't know. So, right, that's the next step is you guess at some goals. And don't be committed to the guess. Be committed to the process of guessing. Mm. And, and I think it's really important to, to give yourself – just be honest, frankly. Let's like let's stop living the fantasy and realize the guess is going to be wrong, right? And so that doesn't make it bad. It just means that's part. So then, when you realize you wake up one day and you go, you know what? I, that idea of sending the kids to state college. We have one daughter that really wants to go to Stanford. We that's actually our new goal. That's okay. It was just a guess, and we yeah. we really down with a sharpie on a piece of <laughs> pair of the car stock up, write on a new one. You know, so. I think that idea, that's the next step, guessing about your goals. And it doesn't mean that you shouldn't get really clear about them and have those smart goals, you know, whatever specific, measurable, actionable, whatever that stands for. But we still have goals, but we're giving ourselves a little permission to live in reality instead of this fantasy that we can control them. Carl, I love, I love listening to you talk. Rod, as, as Carl's talking, I keep thinking he should be a psychologist, a therapist. Because <laughs> the, the way he, I love the way you communicate, Carl. Oh, thank you. Very and I think money is very much about emotion, and I think you're exactly right. And and I agree with Mike, Carl. You're, I'm sitting here shaking my head more than anything, going, "That's exactly right." Um, you know, it it really is it, it, money and and you know, counseling kind of go together in so many ways. Well, it's it's fun. I get asked that a lot, like like from college students or people early in the career, like they think they want to get involved and like what major should I get? Like what should I study? And I, I yeah, I, like now, I mean I got a degree in finance, but I, I think psychology, you know, maybe even marriage counseling um, is equally as valuable. Like the calculators can spit out some of those those, those things, but you know, it's, it's hard. And I think there's an increasing awareness, at least among real financial planners, real financial advisor around the country, that if you think there's a still a job that involves this nice clean lines around the money, right? Spreadsheets and it, like that's being that's gonna go away real fast. And the the real beauty is that intersection between life and money or your use of capital and what you said was important to you. If you can help people manage that delicate trade off over a period of a lifetime yeah, you're gonna have you're gonna have more clients than you need, and you're delivering such a valuable service to people. Yeah. Carl, I think, uh, oh, good, Rod. Oh, well, I was just gonna say, I, you know, I love your uh, emphasis on the guess, and particularly that it's that it's okay to change. It's not that the you know, I when I look at it, it's not that the guess is wrong. It's just changes yeah. over time, but yeah. it's okay to change. And I think people get so focused on setting a goal and then staying with that goal that they forget that, you know, that, that you can change. Life changes and, and, and we need to talk about money in terms of everything that's happening in life because it always changes. Um, and one of the things about, I always say, my grandpa used to say, you know, I'd ask him when I was a kid, you know, how do I know what I'm going to do? And he said, you won't, he would always tell me, you don't, you won't know until you're doing it. But the point was, Life changes, try everything that's in you, experience things, and you'll find it, but it will change, and that's okay. You know, and 
I think your point is is right on the money. No pun intended. Well, yeah, I, yeah, that's funny. Um, <laughs> I I do like the idea. Like, it's not. It's 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 just we're making room by acknowledging that we're making room for the idea that life happens, right? Like, it, yeah. it's just it's just reality. The idea that we could nail down a twenty year financial plan was a fantasy to start with. It mm-hmm. doesn't mean we shouldn't still project out 20 years, but we're just yeah. going to say we're going to just relax a little bit. And, and again, like we're going to make the best guesses we can. It doesn't de-emphasize the value of that guess. Right. I think calling it suggests to the mind, like, hey, we're going to adapt and we're going to be committed. My favorite line, right? Don't be committed to the guess. Be committed to the process of guessing, the ongoing process of guessing. Carl, in, in the guessing process, and I, I was wondering if you could speak to the people out there who maybe feel discouraged that they haven't been, you know, making the right types of planning. They haven't maybe done any investing for retirement, and they're feeling very discouraged. Um, can you speak to them? Um, that maybe they they feel like they made too many money mistakes, and and uh, they feel like it may be too late for them to uh, plan for the future financially. Yeah, I look. The reality is, it's really like we can't ever de-emphasize how hard it is for a lot of people. Like I know, I mean, we've got close family members that like it's tough, right? And yeah. So this sometimes sounds like hard medicine, but I don't know what. Like, what else are we supposed to do? You know, like like so. I think often the that 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 pain comes from the difference between expectations and reality. And because we can't adjust reality, we just need to kind of take the hard medicine of adjusting our expectations. And is that going to be painful? Yeah, but what other choice do we have? Like, what else should we do? We can't just keep living in the sort of fantasy that things are going to change or get better. So sometimes, and that's really, please, I mean, I don't know how to emphasize enough. Like, I, I, I know how hard that is. So the first step, I think, is just to somehow get yourself to have the courage to sit down and create a per, personal balance sheet is what I, I mean, that's what they're sort of referred to. I, I like to think of it as, you know, get really clear about your current reality. And I used to think this was the super easy part of financial planning, um, but I was totally wrong because people don't. Most people haven't done it, and so I started kind of inquiring as to why people don't do it, and it's because it hurts. You know, every line item. If you create a personal balance sheet, just sort of a spreadsheet of your assets and your debt, you know, your liability, you sort of have to remember that that spreadsheet may just be, you know, factual spreadsheet. But the dilemma, of course, is every line item on that spreadsheet tells a story, you know. And it's, so that's why people don't want to do it. But I'm begging you, like, mm-hmm. just muster up the courage to get really clear about where you are. Put on, I like to refer to it as put on your no shame, no blame hat. Mm-hmm. I'm actually having hats made. We're going to start giving away because so many people have been like, where are those I love hats? that. We're going to get a no shame, no blame hat and you, we'll send them out to people and you can put them on before you have this talk with yourself or with your spouse or with a partner or whoever and just commit to the idea that like what's happened in the past is of absolutely no value to you mm. except the lesson. It's not a value for the shame, the blame. You can't change it. It's a sunk cost. Let it go. And I know all of this is like so easy to say and so hard to do. But that's where it starts. And then that little sense, what happens, what I found is a lot of that pain comes from this feeling of lack of control. And the process of creating a, a personal balance sheet will start to build just a teeny, at first, a teeny sense of control. And that teeny sense of control will start to expand. And whenever it feels stressful, let go of anything other than that teeny sense of control. Like, okay, for me, when I had some real tough times financially in Las Vegas, for me, it actually got to the point where it was just about breath. It sounds like a yoga class, but it was it was like everything felt so out of control in my life that the only thing I could control, I remember my friend saying, Carl, you can always control your breath. So I just started focusing on one breath at a time. And there was a couple of days where all I, even weeks where all I could do was link breaths. And then that sense of control expanded a little bit. And I said, all right, where are we? 
All right, okay, and then I wrote down our debts and income and sense of control expanded, and I, I focused on only those things that I could control. If I couldn't control it, I would literally say I can't think about it. And okay, we paid things down, and slowly that sense of control builds, and things start to change, and it takes years, and that's all I know how to do. So build a personal balance sheet. Put on your no shame, no blame hat, and build a personal balance sheet. Carl, thank you for, for sharing that and, and and just talking to that that dilemma that you know many of us are in and and uh, or may be in in the future because life has a lot of unexpected events that happen, medical emergencies and financial uh, issues that come up that can cripple us financially. And Carl, I really appreciate you kind of speaking to that and and talking to those that are especially that are out there right now dealing with mm. um, a financial problem like that. Thank um, you. Before we, we move to the final five, um, I want to ask you this one last question that we're going to be tweeting out, and that is just some last-minute tips to help those uh, to make uh, smarter decisions with our money. Um, so here's my favorite, favorite new thing, and uh, it's just on, it's on spending. We've talked about investing and all this other stuff, so let's just talk about spending for a second. Um, so assuming that you've gotten clear about why you're doing things, hopefully that helps a little bit. Stephen Covey used to say it's it's kind of it's a lot easier to say no to something if you've got a much deeper yes, right? So hopefully this early work gives you a deeper yes. Um, but one of the things that I've loved lately is just start noticing. And this is again, this sounds a little bit like a yoga class. I don't mean it that way, but just start noticing when you spend money and, and there's a lot of tricks you could do to do that um, but every time you pull out the credit card or debit card I'm not I don't mean credit like bad I just mean yeah you know the card itself and sometimes when we say credit card that comes with all this bad connotation it's not at all what I mean it's a great tool you pull out the card or the cash or the checkbook whatever it is you use to spend money just notice and I want you to try to notice um, without any judgment for a little bit, suspend judgment. Stop. We've been taught, and I, it's come up a bunch this week, spending bad, saving good. And, it, and it, it's, it's gotten so deep into our sort of psyche that we've even, we've even sort of bought into the idea that we should make spending painful. Mm. Have your credit cards and use cash because it's painful. I just want you to replace that painful idea with awareness, right? Like, Okay, if you want to use cash because that's that's fine, I totally understand. But we use cash because it increases awareness, not because it makes things more painful. So every time we use cash or the card or the checkbook, I don't really care. But if you're sort of in the into this mood of this one of these cash things, when you pull it out, it just increases awareness. So I just want you to notice. I don't want you to blame. It's not bad or good. Just notice. And I'm telling you what's so powerful about the act of just noticing is the behavior change comes automatic. Like you, if you just start noticing, oh, that's interesting. Like that's my new, those are my new, that's my new favorite financial planning phrase. Oh, isn't that interesting? That's it. No, no, nothing else. No, no, just. Uh. And so Jim Collins used to have this trick. This is one step advanced, right? He used to he, he used to keep a spiral notebook in his a little small pocket notebook in his shirt, and he'd write on the cover of it, "The bug, as an in insect, the bug called Jim." And he would watch himself, and he would say, oh, isn't that interesting? Jim gets angry, you know, around 2 o'clock if he hasn't had lunch. Mm. Interesting, right? So just take that approach with money. Just start noticing. And I'm telling you what will happen is you'll start to say something like, wow, I didn't realize I spent that much money on lunch. It's interesting. And then a couple weeks later, you'll say, oh, you know, I'm we're putting off that trip that we wanted to because we don't have enough money out. Lunch isn't all that important to me. It's eating out. What if I save that money instead? The behavior just starts happening mm. because you've noticed. So there you go. How about thank, that? I love that, Carl. I love that. Uh, Carl, thank you so much for being part of our Hangout. Um, before we move to the final five, can you share with others how they can learn more about you and your latest book? Well, so Behavior Gap, behaviorgap.com is my website. And you can go there and get on the newsletter. We send it out every week with everything going on. Um, Twitter is my sort of only place I spend any time on social media, so Twitter is the best place there. And then, of course, the latest book, uh, 
I'm a big fan of local bookstores, but you know, Amazon is open 24 hours a day. So <laughs> it, is, it is available on Amazon, and um, uh, so super excited. The support's been awesome. I've really, really enjoyed this conversation and and uh, everything going on with the book. So thank you. Thank you. I just pulled up uh, your website on the screen. I noticed you, you are now the book came out yesterday. You already have 55 reviews, five stars on Amazon. It's awesome. How does that feel, Carl? Uh, you know, it's been it's it, I. Actually, I have surprise, surprise. I have it in front of me. There's 62 now. <laughs> oh, awesome! Really, gee, that's moving fast. I, I, it's it's been. I actually was just. I called my wife during lunch and was like, "Look, the books. At, not that I check this every seven at, every seven minutes, but <laughs> the books at number 214 on Amazon, and it's 62 reviews. And I called my wife. And I was like, "It's so amazing." And and I, it, but it. The thing to remember, of course, like, is it it. It's a ten-year overnight success. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like it's there it takes a long time, and I, it's just so gratifying to have a group of people be so supportive. So I, I don't know what else to say about it other than that. Well, congratulations, Carl. Thank you. This book. Uh, so now we're moving to the very last section of our hangout, which is the final five, and this these are just random questions that are not financially related, but just to get to know our guests better. So Carl, the, the very first question I have for you is. You know, we've all seen your awesome financial sketches, and I'm curious: Do you do any other types of sketches that we haven't seen? No, I mean they're the, they're they're sort of the same. I mean, like there's been some about uh, like I got asked once by one of the one of the uh, women's magazines to do some about marriage, which is really fun. So oh. there's been some other topics, but they're all the same. With a sh I only have one tool: a sharpie and cardstock. Um, so yeah, mainly just financially related. I get asked all the time, but mainly financially related. That's cool. Um, second question is: I was watching your hangout with Jeff Rose. You did a while back, and heard that you're into CrossFit. Curious, what are your favorite types of exercises? Yeah. So the key word there is was in the. <laughs> all, it took, all, it, all, it, all it took was a torn labrum. You know, oh no! Military press. It's funny. I, I live in a really active town, Park City, Utah. There's so we have some of the best. Because the U.S. ski team's here, we have some of the best surgeons here, and um, I went in, and he was like, I said, my shoulder hurts, and he looks at yeah. me and goes, let me guess, 45-year-old CrossFit, and I was like, yeah, so so anyway, oh. I, right now, I ride my uh, ride my mountain bike a bunch, and awesome. I just got into, uh, like, enduro-style, um, hard enduro-style motorcycling. Oh, seriously? Oh, yeah, I, I yeah. I've never I've always been somebody who had to suffer like you have to ride your bike everywhere. <laughs> and I got on a motorcycle. I was like, oh my gosh, it feels like the fun police have been removed. You know, like <laughs> so much fun. So anyway, I've been we have a lot of really fun places to ride motorcycles out here. That is awesome. I I, mean, I love mountain biking. I mountain bike here in Orange in the canyon. So that is so cool that you're into biking and and uh, doing the motocross. Yeah. Uh, uh, third question is, what is one of your favorite television shows at the moment? You, I don't even know if you watch TV with all the work that you're doing. No, no, no TV show. I have four kids, and we haven't had a TV for 17 years in the house. Oh wow! I love sports, but I tend to watch them on you know some form of you know something I can get online, and love sports. My son, <laughs> my son loved uh, Duck Dynasty, so we watched that whole series, um, and. Uh, 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 what's the what's the car one that they uh, the there was a car one over in Europe. The guy just got kicked off his own show. Oh yeah, Rod, you know what that one is? Just got kicked off his own show. Oh, um, fi um, Top Gear. Yeah, Top Gear, Top Gear. Yeah. So, yeah. Duck Dynasty and Top Gear, two very great shows with lots of controversy on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, question number four, Carl is. Um, do you like coffee, and if so, what's your favorite coffee shop you go to, and what do you like to order there? <laughs> We're like over three. I don't drink coffee. <laughs> you don't I, drink coffee. No, I'm, but I'm a tea guy, so I do, oh. I do like tea. Yeah. What, what's your favorite kind of tea? Uh, probably chamomile, or I've been getting into this stuff lately. It's like this dark roasted um, dandelion tea that I've been told is a little bit like coffee, but I don't drink coffee. Hmm. Okay. But I do love coffee shops. I do love coffee shops. Yeah, I like coffee shops. I love the smell of coffee. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very last question. Um, we have asked this to many guests, and this is something that came up from Claire from Radio for Zero. She came up with this question. It's, what is your spirit animal? Oh, jeez. 
I've been I I I was sort of prepared for that. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, it would be really funny to ask my wife what she thinks it is. <laughs> a, a monkey. Um, but I think an eagle. It's always been my favorite animal. Always been my favorite animal. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I want to let everyone know that if you'd like to learn more about Carl, to get links to his social profiles, links to his brand new book, as well as links to Behavior Gap, you can go to our Experian blog, and the URL is ex.pn slash Carl R. And that will bring you to a page where you can learn all about Carl, um, as well as we want to recommend you go straight to his website, behaviorgap.com. I want to let you know that we have this credit chat every single Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern here on Twitter and on YouTube. And if you'd like to see past episodes or upcoming events, go to ex.pn slash credit chat or just Google the word credit chat. I want to let you know that next week we're going to be talking about identity theft and how to protect yourself, so make sure to join us next Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we'll be talking about identity theft. Last, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Do you have any topics or guests you would like featured in Credit Chat? Please let us know by tweeting to at Experian underscore US. We always love hearing from our community. We would love to know what topics and guests you would like featured in our Credit Chat. Last, if you'd like to subscribe, we, we encourage you to subscribe here on YouTube. And um, after this live event, these different videos will be active, so you can click to see some past episodes. I want to thank Carl so much for being our guest today, and um, we look forward to talking and tweeting with you all next week. Thanks for having me. Carl, thank you again. Thank you so much. We are, um, right now we are...